Good morning and welcome to worship on Sunday the 16th of May. Today we celebrate Ascension Sunday. On Thursday it was Ascension Day where Luke records Jesus disappearing into the heavens. However we understand what happened, it is a significant moment in the ministry of Jesus and the Apostles. Hidden by the cloud reminds us of the time on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus speaks with Elijah and Moses, or in the Old Testament where God leads his people with a cloud pillar. Threads weave together showing that our faith is part of a greater story. We are not alone. Generations have walked the narrow path before us and even more will walk it after us. In a time where we might feel worried about the future, let us trust in God who holds the past, the present and the future in his hands. Our call to worship this week comes from the book of Daniel. You might remember Daniel from stories such as Daniel and the lion's den, or perhaps remember that he's the original healthy eater guru with his diet of vegetables and water. However, he was also gifted with heavenly visions that we probably uh, struggle to comprehend in today's age. But Daniel was alive long before Jesus was, and he was blessed with seeing Jesus before even his mother Mary held him in her arms. So reassured that this is that this in this passage that the past and the future are held by God in tandem. We can worship God who was and is and is to come. So we listen for the word of God taken from Daniel chapter 7, just a few verses from the New Century Version. Daniel writes, As I looked, thrones were put in their places, and God the Eternal One sat on his throne. His clothes were white like snow, and the hair on his head was white like wool. His throne was made from fire, and the wheels of his throne were blazing with fire. A river of fire was flowing from in front of him. Many thousands of angels were serving him, and millions of angels stood before him. Court was ready to begin, and the books were opened. In my vision at night, I saw in front of me someone who looked like a human being coming on the clouds in the sky. He came near God, who had been alive forever, and he was led to God. He was given authority, glory, and the strength of a king. People of every tribe, nation, and language will serve him. His rule will last forever, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. Amen. And thanks be to God. Jesus was before the world. He came into the world. And he will be there when time ends. Following our hymn, we go into a time of prayer with the Lord's Prayer. And then Heather Nielsen is leading us in our Bible reading, sharing the Ascension story as is recorded in the book of Acts. Our hymn first, though, is sung by the virtual choir of St. Michael and All Angels Bassett. And I pray that this music and singing will connect with your soul and bring a sense of worship as we praise our Lord together. A wonderful hymn, the head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. Oh, 
I love the imagery in this prayer from Donald Hilton writing in about 1996, and I share it with you as we come humble into his eternal presence. We start with Donald's words and then continue in prayer. Let us pray. Ascension, Lord, we would have lingered on the Mount of Transfiguration, clung to you in the Easter garden, been saddened by your Emmaus departure and begged the ascension skies never to close. But you have taught us deeper truth. You are not absent even in departure. We give thanks that mountaintop resources lie waiting in the valley, that you are as near in the busy streets as in the quiet garden, that you are the guest at every meal and heaven has come down to earth as one day earth may be as heaven. Ascension Lord, travel with us. Help us to live with our feet firmly planted on your earth, walking the path of mission, sharing the love of Christ with our attitude and actions, blessing and welcoming the other, the lost, the grieving, the hurting, the dying. Lift our eyes heavenward, that we might remember we are your children and that we too are blessed. May your spirit enable us to worship in gratitude and in praise. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, that so easily we hold on to the past like a child with a comforter, unable to believe that we can embrace the unknown. Forgive us when our eyes are downcast, when our footsteps are heavy and our hearts are cold. Forgive us when we forget that you hold everything, that no matter how unraveled we feel, your stitches are secure. Show us the threads of faith that bind us to each other and to you, that we might be vibrant and joy-filled. Truly may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so in your name, and with the words of your people, we pray together with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Today's reading is taken from Acts, chapter 1, reading from verse 1. Dear Theophilus, In my first book I wrote about all the things that Jesus did and taught from the time he began his work until the day he was taken up to heaven. Before he was taken up, he gave instructions by the power of the Holy Spirit to the men he had chosen as his apostles. For forty days after his death, he appeared to them many times in waves that proved beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him, and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. And when they came together, he gave them this order, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I told you about, the gift my father promised. John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is taken up to heaven. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said to them, The times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority. It is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up to heaven as they watched him, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away, when two men, dressed in white, suddenly stood beside them and said, 
Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. We give thanks to God for these readings from his holy book. Amen. It's funny how life rarely works out the way you planned. Maybe you're one of the lucky ones. You planned your life as a young person and it has gone in the direction that you thought. But quite often, whatever we planned as children, as teenagers, even as young adults, perhaps isn't quite what happened when we look back on our life's journey. As Robbie Williams sings in one of his songs, and God just laughs at my plans. A favourite song of mine growing up was actually quite an old song, Que sera, sera, what will be, will be. And yet, like so many others, I remember those times where I had planned out my life, only for God, for change, for consequences of mine and others' actions to get in the way. I was going to go to Glasgow University when I finished at Open High School, but guess what? I wasn't smart enough for Glasgow. I didn't study hard enough for those exams and get the grades, consequences of my actions. Edinburgh University thankfully wasn't quite so fussy and was quite happy to take my money and I did all right with them. I remember as a teenager being very passionate about the fact I was never getting married. Married life from what I saw was just too hard. I grew up in a time where Divorce was becoming more common and we spoke about stepbrothers and stepsisters, terms that thankfully we don't use quite the same today. I certainly didn't fancy bringing children into this messed up world either. I did not think it was fair or responsible. Don't you just love being a teenager where you have these idealistic notions? I wanted a scientific career, particularly weather related or perhaps on my kind of other days, wanted to be a lawyer. But I remember my mum telling me that she didn't want me to limit my options by just taking the sciences. And here I stand today. It's funny. I do wonder if God laughs sometimes at my plans. But the question is, as we look back, would we change the direction of travel? For the disciples, now known as the apostles, they must have wondered how they ended up where they ended up as they stood there watching Jesus go into the heavens. After all, for most of them growing up, their lives were mapped out for them. It was expected, of course, to have work, usually the family trade, get married, have children, and children were a gift from God and a blessing. So a form of wealth and status. And so the cycle would continue. For some, it was following in the footsteps of a rabbi. And depending on wealth and who you knew and location, you may step out on a new venture as the world continued to open up more and more with trade. Suddenly, though, for these people in, particularly, in particular, sorry, they're on a completely different path from where they ever imagined they would be. And again, it's changing direction. They're asked to wait, but something else is coming. They're going to have to continue on a journey that started perhaps accidentally and has led to this amazing moment. It's that stepping into the unknown with God again that we face in today's story. But in order to step into the unknown, they have to wait. And waiting is the hard part. As a general rule, the average human being does not like waiting. And in our current culture, where everything has to have happened yesterday, where we have delivery, you order first thing and you get it by the end of the day and so on and so forth, we have become quite demanding and we're not very good at waiting. Of course, as British folks, we do know how to queue and we readily tut at those who break the etiquette. We can also be jealous of the sneaky and the gutsy. And I must admit, I have learned how to play the roundabouts here in East Kilbride. 
if the past 15 months or so has taught us anything, it is the art of waiting. And for some, the art of waiting is like a child's scrawl on a piece of paper than Van Gogh's masterpieces. But waiting isn't necessarily time wasted. Of course, sometimes it is. But waiting for God, and that's kind of where this story is at, waiting for God is not time wasted. If anything, it's a gift from God. It's time that we need and time that he gives in so many of our stories throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. God knows we need time. We need time to process information and circumstances, to heal, to learn, to rest, to mature, to grow up. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean that we automatically know it all, that we're happy all the time, that we love people readily, that we forgive easily, and that we're all gifted with patience and self-control, if only. We need time to grow and develop in our faith, in the characteristics of God, and to learn and experience him. Time, even time of waiting, is not time wasted. The time between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, according to Luke, is 40 days. And in that time, the disciples met with Jesus on multiple occasions in different places, and they're reassured that he's not a ghost, that he eats food, and that ultimately he is still Jesus, despite death and resurrection. Jesus takes the opportunities to teach and to help them understand during this time of transition. Often we want to get from A to B without drawing breath or reflecting on what has been. But the disciples needed this transition time from discipleship to apostles, from followers to leaders in the sense of ministry. They needed time to move from the horrors of the crucifixion to the sheer incomprehensibility of resurrection before they could witness the ascension. They needed, to, they needed time to get through all of that. It's not just a case of, wow, it happened, thank God, and move on. This was huge. And the wonder of it is that once again, God acknowledges our humanity, our frailty, our limited comprehension. Of course, the disciples would have loved to hold on to Jesus longer. Who wouldn't? They needed that time with him, but they also needed to witness him leaving. After all, post-resurrection, Jesus had a habit of just turning up randomly and even appearing in locked rooms. So they needed to know for sure that Jesus was no longer going to be with them. But it had to be done in such a way that they could truly appreciate what was going to come next. And again, they have to wait. There has to be a time of letting go of, of Jesus in the earthly sense of having him walk along physically beside them to embracing the Holy Spirit who would come 10 days later at Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection. And we're going to explore Pentecost next week and the life of the Holy Spirit eh, over just these next couple of weeks. And if you're in church next week or even just around in your own place, Red is the colour of Pentecost, lovely, vibrant red or orange or whatever. But in church, we would use red as our colour. And if you're coming to a church service, I eh, do encourage you to wear red and just add that flame eh, to that colour to a service, being bright and vibrant, just as the Holy Spirit is. So I want to reassure you that this time in between things is actually really important. And it wasn't a time of doing nothing. With Jesus in the 40 days, the disciples received their commission to go and make disciples in all the world. They witness the ascension of Jesus and they go away again full of joy, praising God. And they spend these days in between in prayer and replacing Judas Iscariot with uh, Matthias. 
they don't really know how long they're going to have to wait, but it makes sense that another festival that's already in progress is, is blessed by God in this way. After all, we are a continuation of Judaism and not a new religion as such. So waiting doesn't have to be wasted time. It's an important, oft, sometimes missed opportunity because we don't always appreciate waiting. Perhaps if you feel that you are waiting for something significant, you are in a season of transition, of preparation. What is God calling you to? But somehow maybe he needs you to do something before you get to whatever that calling is. So maybe he's calling you to healing or to restoration, to forgiveness or prayer. Perhaps it's practical. Perhaps you need to move house, move job. Maybe you need to do less. Maybe you need to do more. Even coming through a pandemic is a time of transition or changing from one ministry to a new ministry. These are transitional times, but not necessarily time wasted. Sometimes we find this time really frustrating and we're in a hurry to get to wherever it is we think we are being led to. And we find that God is actually gently nudging or knocking us, trying to, trying to help us engage with where we need to be at before we get to wherever we're going. And we refuse to comply and we don't understand why everything feels so heavy and so burdensome. Maybe if it is too hard, maybe too impossible for us to figure out how to move forward. Maybe if we can't see the wood for the trees, maybe this is a time of waiting. Of dealing with all those questions that we've looked at over these past few weeks and you've kind of shied away from them. Sometimes we just need to wait. We all have a part to play in the Great Commission, but sometimes we forget that we need to learn, to grow, to heal, to mature, or to accept a change in direction. So if you want to explore this time of waiting further and you want a passage perhaps to focus on, I totally recommend looking at the story of the vine in John chapter 15 where there is that whole concept of abiding in God. The time of abiding is what pro produces a time of fruitfulness. The other risk we have, especially in a time of transition, is that we set our sights too short. I am short sighted and that as yet means I don't need reading glasses, but that's coming. But it does mean that the further you sit back in church, for example, the less I can see, or at least the less detail I can see. The disciples in this story just remind us how easy it is, especially when we're tired, when we're uncertain, when we're anxious, how we kind of pull everything in at that bit closer and we get quite more blinkered or more narrow focused or short sighted. The disciples think that Jesus will rescue Israel, not the world, but Israel. And the church is in a very similar place at the moment, particularly coming out of the pandemic, that we run the risk of being short sighted and seeing just the now rather than the whole. With God's vision, we can look beyond the immediate, the now. We might not need to be standing, staring up into the heavens, waiting for Jesus to return. But we do need to look forward and trust that there is a grand plan. Blended in the story today is so much more that I could unpack, but just let me offer this reassurance, especially for those who are feeling really anxious in these unsettled times. Within that story of ascension, we are shown the past as well as the future. We are reminded about the threads that connect us together. And like I said at the beginning of our service, there are images there that remind us of the story of the Mount of Transfiguration or the story of the Exodus where God is present. We are called to be witnesses, not stargazers, 
We are called to move in the power of the Spirit, not stand still. I still stand by a comment I made a couple of weeks ago. I want to thrive, not just survive. God may laugh at my plans. I don't know that he does, but he may laugh at my plans. And if he did, I'm glad. Because right now there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Whether you are in a season of waiting or doing, remember God is there with you. And we will explore that further next week as we look at the spirit of life. And then on the following Sunday, which is known as Trinity Sunday, we'll be looking at the life of the spirit. It's challenging to wait. It's not easy to wait. But maybe this is a time of waiting, of transition, of change. What happens if you listen to God and see where he wants to take you? I'm going to listen to a beautiful piece of music and I encourage you to reflect on where you're at at the moment and where you think God might be leading you as we allow God to speak to us or just to ponder, just to pray and be grateful for all the times God has been with us through our doing and our waiting. So this is a beautiful song, Go to Make Disciples, sung by the Sunday 7pm choir based in Canada. With their permission, we show this. And following this, we have a short message from David Kennedy, who is our energy efficiency officer, as we approach the end of Christian Aid Week with its theme on the climate emergency. Energy Efficiency Officer for this church and parish. It's exciting times here at Moncrief, a new minister and a beautifully refurbished church. Today is the end of Christian Aid Week. It's always a busy week for me as I'm Christian Aid Coordinator for my own church in Airdrie. I first started collecting round the doors for Christian Aid aged just 15 with my mum. One year we took in a lot more money than usual. It had rained a lot, 
My mum was convinced that people had donated out of sympathy for her, as her hair had been so bedraggled. Christian Aid's main campaign is to tackle the climate crisis, as the world's poorest people are already bearing the brunt of climate change. It's great to be able to support an organisation with such a track record as Christian Aid of working in partnership with churches around the globe. As Energy Efficiency Officer, my remit is also to tackle climate change, to help us do what we can here in Moncrief Church and also in Calderwood. The church building has been made hugely more energy efficient and we now have recycling bins in place. But as well as helping Moncrief reduce its carbon footprint, my job is to help individuals and households, you, to reduce yours. We can do that by saving energy at home, reducing waste and thinking about how we travel around. Like you, I've been inspired by our Minister Sarah to make some small changes over the past week for our future climate. I walked rather than drove for some short journeys. The fresh air felt good and I stopped to talk to a few people I knew. I have also sorted out my clothing so I can get damaged items fixed at a local sewing business. I'm keen to get more life out of my clothes and to generate less waste. Shortly, I'll be sending a letter to all church members giving some tips for reducing your own carbon footprint and encouraging you to contact me for more advice. As restrictions ease, I will be able to do home visits and organise events and workshops to help us all play our part. You may have heard the phrase, think global, act local. Globally, we make ourselves aware of the climate crisis. We support the work of organisations like Christian Aid. And we pray for this wonderful, diverse world that God has made us stewards of. Locally, let's do what we can to tackle the climate crisis as we live our lives. Thanks very much for listening to me. I look forward to seeing you all very soon as together we tackle the climate crisis. Thank you for that message, David, and thank you for the continued support for Moncrief and the work of the wider church. We have included an offering dedication in our service and in the, in the prayers here, and we come before God now in prayer. Let us pray. Generous God, who blesses us all, we thank you and praise you. And we want to make disciples in your name and support your people who reach out to others in your name. Therefore, accept all our offerings of time, of talent, of money, and most importantly, of love, that we might join you in spreading the good news. Loving God, we come into your presence well aware that not all is well within your world. When you looked at all you had made, you were happy and saw that it was good. But Lord, we wonder how your heart breaks as you live amongst us now. Creation laments as we abuse, bully and rape it for fuel, food and wealth. Lord, may we truly repent as your people and live with care, compassion and grace, sensitive to seasons and life cycles. God of all people, we pray for the situations where we have forgotten how to love, to share, to embrace difference and welcome the stranger and the refugee. For those who faced up to the immigration officers in peaceful but resolute protest, we give you thanks. We pray for wisdom, for compassion and for mercy. And remember that we are called to love our neighbour. We pray for the hurting and broken people in the escalating, terrifying situation in Israel and Palestine. We pray that we wouldn't be quick to judge or easily swayed by media bias and political rhetoric. 
We pray for a swift end to the fighting, the destruction, the loss of innocence and life. We pray for understanding and peaceful resolution. Lord, we pray for an end to this long-running conflict, but we acknowledge that this will not be easy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear us and raise your voice again in the land that your son called home. We pray for the upcoming General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. We pray for our commissioners who face some really difficult decisions and will be asked to support impossible to comprehend situations. We pray that your church, your folks, will trust in your provision, be blessed with wisdom and be gentle with one another. Forgive our doubts, our cynicism and our years of apathy. Raise up your pioneers and prophets. Soften our hearts and excite our hearts and minds that we might be confident in you and your hold on our present and our future. Bless those who still face the challenge of the pandemic, remembering in particular India and other places where the virus and its effects are rife and lives are lost. We pray for healthcare across the world, especially where it has been overwhelmed, where medical staff at all levels have been deeply affected by the pandemic, and where, though the virus has lessened its grip, there are still challenges ahead. As we move forward here in Scotland, keep us sensible even in our joy. Make us wise and gracious and ever so patient. And if we are asking the impossible of ourselves, at least keep our hearts soft, our minds open, our hands clean, our masks on, and kindness in our attitudes. In your name and for your creation, your people, your church, your world, we pray. May your kingdom truly be evident here amongst us. Amen. Thank you for joining with us in worship, and I hope that if you are watching on YouTube, that you'll su sub subscribe, try and get my teeth in for that one, um, or just continue to be uh, friends with us on Facebook. Please do check our website for updated information as well. And of course, if you're in the area, you're always welcome to come along. With gratitude to you all for the sponsorship and participation for the Kilt Walk, I can confirm that we have received £10,000 or I should say £10,060, which was topped up last week. So it's now at £10,100 for the budget to improve our audiovisual equipment and to allow some live streaming to go ahead as well. Thank you for the support for Christian Aid. And remember that you can donate via online or in envelopes if you've got those. The General Assembly of the Church of Scotland starts on Saturday the 22nd of May. And you can follow the proceedings on the Church of Scotland website please hold them in prayer. Significant decisions include cuts of 35 to 40 percent of presbytery posts, assisting of all plans until new mission plans are designed, and items on stewardship and changes to ministry and mission funding. And that's just some of it. You can already watch the convener's speeches. They've been recorded and will not be shown on the day of the General Assembly but, or on the days of, but uh, are available to watch now. To help you grasp what that means, Hamilton Presbytery will be asked to cut posts from 57.5 to 34.5. So that is a big drop. After the GA has met, I'll try and share the key points with you. But for now, please hold them in prayer. Congregational Board in Kirk Session are reminded that we have a meeting via Zoom on Thursday the 27th of May. Thank you to Lisa for coping so well with the challenges of the booking system and requests. I appreciate the feedback and uh, we'll take that all under advisement as well. And I um, just want to say that we are continuing with the online and telephone services. So please don't feel the pressure to be in the building either. We're going to continue our service now with a song of praise, following which we will have our blessing. And this is brought to us by Matt Beckingham, uh, again from CH4. He is Lord. He is Lord. Not quite in the same order as in our hymn book, but this is a really good rendition of it. And I hope that you enjoy praising God and perhaps joining in with this particular song. Please stay on afterwards for the blessing. Thank you.
He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is King, He is King. He will draw nations to Him, He is King. And the time shall be when the world shall sing that Jesus Christ is King. He is love, oh He is love. He has shown us by His life that He is love. All His people sing with one voice of joy that Jesus Christ is love. He is life, oh, He is life. He has died to set us free, and He is life. And He calls us all to live evermore for Jesus. Christ is life. Oh, He is life. And our blessing. God loves you so very much. Christ our King make you faithful and strong to do His will and bring you to reign with Him in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you now and for evermore. Amen. <laughs>